Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Dr. Amit Borse and I'm a senior product manager with IVA, a division of MQR Pharmaceuticals Limited, a pioneer in the field of gynecology and IVF. We at MQR are on a mission to nurture and support 28 days with programming 28. The concept is based on managing the ovarian cycle with exogenously given GnRH analogs, gonadotropins and hormone as per different protocols to fulfill the desire of motherhood. MQR promises to deliver all possible support in terms of therapeutic agents and academic support like this. At this time when there is a complete lockdown due to outbreak of COVID-19 with the help of this beautiful technology, we have tried to get the doctors together and continue with academics. Uh, with, uh, in this time of COVID, doctors are the frontline warriors and MQR dedicates a video for them. Sir, with your permission, I would like to uh, share that video once. Yeah, please. please. Thank you, sir. <laughs> सभी का ख्याल रखते हो बस लक्ष्य है सेवा सेवा से कभी ना थकते हो नहीं जान की परवा निकले हो जान बचाने को तुम रोक ही लोगे आधी जहाने को शुक्रिया भारत के बड़ी मौत सांसों के पीछे बने तुम जो मसीहा जगी जिंदगी में उम्मीदें वहाँ वीर खड़े हैं उन सरहदों की रक्षा में यहाँ आप डटे हैं इंडिया की सुरक्षा में शुक्रिया भारत के योद्धाओं एम प्यार करे सलाम आपको Thank you. Really good. Thank you. Yeah. thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, all the delegates who are there with us. Uh, I'll take forward this introduction. Uh, today we have with us Dr. Jatin Shah, sir. And thank you, sir, for helping us uh, to do this webinar and accepting our request again. Sir will be speaking on the topic ovarian stimulation and embryo transfer. Redefined. Uh, Dr. Jatin Shah, sir, does not require any introduction, but as a protocol, Give me two minutes to do that. Dr. Jatin Shah, sir, is dedicated to the treatment of infertile couples and was instrumental for establishing more than 15,000 successful IVF pregnancies over the past 25 years. He has helped establish the first IVF ICSI pregnancies in UP and Kerala states. He has co-authored textbooks, photographic atlas of gynecological and obstetric operative techniques in his student days. He was awarded Best Paper Presentation in National Foxy Congress in 1995. He was also awarded Young Personality of the Year in 2003. He, was, he has pioneered the setting up of IVF centers in Cochin, Agra, Madurai, Irodi, Irod, Chennai and Pune. More than 500 national and international presentation, guest lectures, keynote addresses and oration. He is a founder member of Asia Pacific Initiative for Reproductive Endocrinology. He has published original research papers on use of GCSF in repeated IVF failures, failures association of progesterone elevation on day of HCG and pregnancy outcomes in IVF, preterm birth among pregnancies and conceived by ART in Mumbai. Thank you, sir. We are honored to have you again and uh, session is all over to you. Please share your presentation, sir. Yeah. 
So very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be back for this uh, wonderful webinars organized by MQR. And today we have a bit of a marathon session. So let's hope that all of you stick with us till the end because we are going to cover a lot of IVF today, uh, especially ovarian stimulation. Might be a little bit of repetition from last time's webinar for you, maybe in the first 20 minutes or so. And then we move on to embryo transfer because a lot of new things happening there as to who should be having frozen transfers, uh, where can you do fresh transfer, what is the advantage of a natural cycle versus an artificial cycle and so on and so forth. So let's begin first with ovarian stimulation. So we all know that uh, when we talk of ovarian stimulation, what exactly are our goals? We know that at no cost uh, do we want ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. We want good patient acceptability, we want good efficacy, we want safety, we want it to be cost effective too. But where do we stop? Do we just want to do one cycle of ovarian stimulation to get one euploid embryo and give the patient a chance of a pregnancy? Do we want to do one cycle and ensure that she gets one live birth so we have enough embryos for say one or two transfers? Or you want to do one cycle and be done with it, means she gets her first pregnancy, she gets her first live birth, after a couple of years she comes back, you still have surplus frozen embryos, you again transfer and again give her a second live birth. So the current thinking is that ovarian stimulation, the first cycle is the most important. Your focus should be on trying to get the maximum eggs, maximum embryos for freezing so that you are done with just one cycle in almost 60 to 70% of your patients. What are the aims of stimulation? Of course, this is a very popular slide, but what I want to highlight here is the main aim which everybody neglects is that you want a uniform cohort of follicles. That is very, very important. We do not want one follicle to race ahead of the others. We want that the entire cohort should be uniform and this is especially important in poor responders because if you have just three or four follicles and one of them becomes dominant, then obviously you don't get a good cohort of eggs. You, of course, old thinking was that you want 5 to 15 good quality oocytes because it was considered that in fresh embryo transfer, going beyond 15 doesn't give good pregnancy rates. So 5 to 15 was the ideal number. Things have changed in the last decade. You, of course, don't want a premature LH surge, which would otherwise occur in about 20 to 25 percent of patients. At no cost do you want hyperstimulation. You want to be an OHSS free clinic. You want minimal injections. And in these COVID times now, you want devices or injections where the husband can inject or the wife can self-inject to minimize the visits. You don't want hyperstimulation because that would again entail an admission. Again, in these COVID times, that's not an ideal scenario to have. You, of course, want a good endometrium. You want adequate embryos for freezing to get a good cumulative live birth rate. And you want cost effectiveness in the Indian uh, context. So this was the classical slide by Sankara, which clearly showed that the number of oocytes that best optimized live birth rate was at 15. So pregnancy rates keep increasing with increasing number of oocytes until 15, after which there is a plateau and then there is actually a drop because the higher the number of oocytes, the higher the estradiol levels, the more advanced is the endometrium and the lower the endometrial receptivity. So for fresh transfers, we stop at 15 being the ideal number of oocytes. But now, we are not just talking about fresh live births because in centers like ours, where we are dealing with patients who had repeated IVF failures, failed twice, thrice, somewhere in the world, you want to offer them something different. And a lot of them have failed previously because they had fresh embryo transfers. So although the ideal number of oocytes for fresh transfers was considered as 13, when you look at cumulative live births, when you add on frozen embryo transfers, the graph doesn't fall at 13, but in fact goes on increasing as you have more and more number of eggs and in fact just plateaus at around 27 oocytes. That means the ideal number of oocytes, if you are planning frozen embryo transfers once, twice for the first live birth, second live birth, is around 25 to 27. So you should be targeting to get that many oocytes if you want that many good quality, top quality embryos for freezing so that you give her the best cumulative live birth rate. So this has now come to us of course, we know today that the most meaningful outcome in IVF is the cumulative live birth rate. And that only increases with the number of eggs retrieved. However, we have to remember that any oocyte yield beyond 27 may be practically pointless. So there's no point if a patient is young, she's a potential normal responder, she needs 225 IU. We are not advocating that, okay, give her 450 IU so that you get 40 oocytes and you get a higher cumulative live birth rate. No, safety is still number one on the list. And of course, we don't want to overdose because getting more than 20, 25 oocytes will result in a wastage of a lot of good quality embryos because most patients would not want more than a couple of live births. So let's keep around 27 as the ideal number. And of course, when you, once you reach 30, 40, 50 oocytes, the ovaries are enlarged. 
even if you have given an agonist trigger there is always a risk of ovarian torsion so you have to be careful on those grounds two protocols which are my personal favorites one is of course the long protocol the agonist protocol where you begin it from day 21 the usual dose is usually 0.5 ml you reduce to 0.3 ml when you begin uh, giving the fsh or hmg you of course have to ensure that she is completely down regulated and you have to then begin fsh hmg on whichever day convenient to you so that the egg retrieval falls as per uh, your schedule of when your lab is working and which days of the week you want the egg retrieval to fall on so the beauty of the long protocol was that you could program your batches it is ideal for batch work you can manipulate cycles you can do pickups as and when you want you don't really have to worry about when she menstruated but there are some problems with this so if you want to optimize your agonist protocol you have to make sure that she has not escaped especially in a batch ivf occasionally you will find one or two patients they escape the effect of the agonist they again form a triple line endometrium you might see a follicle or a cyst in one of the ovaries in that case you cannot begin fsh stimulation you have to again give her a shot of progesterone again let her bleed usually within a week she will bleed then ensure that there are no follicles or cysts the endometrium is completely shed off and that she is ready now for beginning your fsh or hmg the contrary is also true that there may be over suppression suppose the first patient in your batch has taken the agonist for 25 to 30 days there is a very high chance that she will be over suppressed her endogenous fsh lh will be so low that you will need very high doses of fsh preferably hmg because you need lh also in these patients to make sure that she doesn't end up with a hypo response and gives you the optimal ideal number of oocytes that you wished for the biggest drawback of the agonist protocol is that you cannot use a agonist trigger so please remember you cannot use a long protocol for potential high responders so anybody thin lean pcos or a amh of more than say 2.53 uh, you have to be uh, careful and just stick to the antagonist protocol so that if she has more than 15 follicles you can just safely go ahead with the agonist trigger just freeze all the embryos and transfer in a subsequent cycle you also need to remember that when you are stimulating the oocytes we do not prefer the depo preparations it's better to use daily subcutaneous again for the same problem that you do not want over suppression of the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis the biggest drawbacks of course as i mentioned earlier was that if by mistake you give the agonist protocol in a potential high responder or a normal responder who responds as a high responder despite your best precautions you will have a very high risk of ovarian hyperstimulation and we know that you can't do much when that happens posting doesn't give very good results finally you have only two options either you cancel the cycle if there are too many follicles or if she is in a medium risk you just freeze all the embryos continue with cabagolin or agonist or whatever it is and make sure that that one week post egg retrieval passes off without any mishaps or any severe hyperstimulation of course because you have totally cut off endogenous fsh lh you obviously need a higher dose of exogenous fsh lh so you might marginally increase the cost of therapy and we have to remember here that you can only give hcg trigger you cannot give an agonist trigger in a long protocol antagonist on the other hand very simple to use and just the other day i heard a webinar uh, from renji hospital in shanghai which has restarted very successfully despite the covid problem and they very clearly advised that until covid is with us just stick to the antagonist protocol even that one in 20 one in 30 with all your experience with the agonist you don't want hyperstimulation and admissions and ascitic tappings and all that to reduce the hospital visits and not have any problem on your hand so stick to the antagonist if you are still a beginner and you are not sure of which protocol to select so that you have safety first also we now want to minimize visits because we know that ivf usually in some clinics they do Uh, too many estradiol levels progesterone levels maybe 8 or 10 visits for follicle studies and so on so it's time now to change that something which i have always been practicing for almost 20 years now and it's just a day 2 scan a day 7 scan for those adjustments day 10 or day 11 for the hcg trigger and day 12 or 13 for the egg retrieval so you should try and finish the entire thing in just four visits and please try to minimize don't keep having blood collected every time you don't really need e2 levels and progesterone levels except one progesterone on the day of hcg if you are planning a fresh transfer if anyway there is a foregone decision to do a freeze all which is also the recommendation in covid times that it's better to do freeze all for all patients then it's best just not to do any hormone estimations whatsoever you just need your scan on day 2 day 7 day 10 and you are ready for the egg retrieval and the freeze all 
antagonist cycle again most important is that very at least 30 40% of patients if you have not given them any pre treatment and they directly turn up on day 2 or day 3 very likely that one of the follicles will become dominant and you will not have your uh, uniform cohort of follicles so it's very important to pre treat either estrogen from day 25 or norethisterone from day 20 or you can give the antagonist just on days 2, 3 and 4 and then begin stimulation from day 5 except the OC pill which normally has not been recommended for programming of cycles but there is a very recent publication from February this year that you can use OC pills especially in high responders but if you give just 10 days so all the previous papers which showed bad outcomes with OC pill pretreatment were with obviously longer duration of OC pill 20, 30, 40 days of pretreatment to bring together a batch but if you use it just for 10 days, then the suppressive effects are not too bad and there is, uh, the results are on par with the usage of estrogen or progesterone or the antagonist as pre-treatment. You remember that you cannot have fixed protocols. You have to initiate antagonists at 14 mm. So if you see the follicles, quite a good antral follicle count, follicle is a little bigger than the normal size on day two, day three. You can call her on day six. Other patients you can call on day seven. Usually 8 out of 10 will be 14 millimeters on that day and that is the day you begin giving the antagonist. Very important when you start the antagonist, you don't have to step up your FSH dose. You don't have to do anything else. You might switch to HMG or add some LH if you feel that the endometrium is still thin or maybe she is a bit of a hypo responder. The follicles are still 10 mm instead of what you expected 14 mm. You could switch to HMG or add LH at that time. Also, the time interval between antagonists should not exceed 30 hours. The time between the last antagonist and HCG should not exceed 30 hours. You cannot post. Now, this is the biggest problem with the antagonist. Two important things you have to remember. One, pre-treatment is mandatory to ensure that you get a uniform cohort of follicles and posting cannot be done. So, if the pickup falls on a Sunday, please go on the Sunday morning and do the egg retrieval. If you try to push her to Monday, you are most likely going to end up with post-mature oocytes. So there are some conflicting papers that, oh, you can give half dose and postpone by a day or two. But in my experience, the, the pregnancy rates, even the oocyte quality, the embryo quality is not as it would have been if you would have done it on that holiday or a Sunday. So these are the problems with the antagonist cycle, which you must keep in mind. The beauty of the antagonist cycle, of course, is that you can become an OHSS free clinic because you will just not have any hyperstimulation because you have the flexibility of using an agonist trigger instead of uh, giving HCG in these patients. So all you need to do, because we know that with the agonist, there will be a surge of endogenous FSH and LH, uh, which will have a very short half-life. It will help the oocytes to be converted to metaphase 2 or mature oocytes. You will retrieve your oocytes, but you will have a very, very low incidence of uh, any kind of hyperstimulation because the corpora lutea just settled down within, uh, say, about uh, a day or two and even if you have retrieved say 30 uh, 40 oocytes you will not have any hyperstimulation in these patients so this is the beauty of the antagonist trigger that you become a zero ohss or ohss free clinic of course as a side effect the corpora lutea are highly deficient they resolve too fast any amount of exogenous estrogen progesterone you pump into the luteal phase is not going to work you have to freeze all whenever you give an agonist trigger and you cannot and should not do a fresh embryo transfer. The most important slide and the simplest slide in the entire presentation is current thinking now is that your initial selection of the dose is the most important part of stimulation. I'm sure all of you know how to use the agonist, antagonist and so on. But what you really need to skill up to and really need to master is what starting dose should you give a patient so that she gives you the best crop of maximum number of good quality oocytes and top quality embryos to make sure that you have a fantastic cumulative live birth rate. In a normal potential normal responder, so a young patient, normal AFC, normal AMH, would you use 100? You can look here, oocytes retrieved significantly higher with 200 versus 100. So for a normal responder, 200 is better than 100. Some of you would argue, why not 150? I always give 150. Again, if you compare to 150, you get much more oocytes with 200 or 225 as compared to 150. Then some of you would argue, then why not give 300 and be done with it? When you increase beyond 225 and go to 300, there is no increase in the number of oocytes retrieved. 
So the best or the sweet spot stimulation for a normal responder with a normal BMI seems to be 225. If she is a high BMI patient, you could go up to 300. But going beyond 300 doesn't really work for any category of patients. So normal responders, my recommendations as per this recent Cochrane analysis, 225 is the best dose for most potential normal responders. Even the cycle cancellation rate you will see is significantly lower with 200 or 225 as compared to 100. And it definitely favors 225 as compared to even 150. And if you compare 225 and 300, again, there is no difference in the cancellation rate. So 225 is what you should stick to for most normal BMI patients. A lot of you start with 150 and then on day seven, when you don't see adequate follicles, you say, oh, let's now increase to 300. This doesn't really work. So please remember, that is why I said the most important slide was that you have to select the starting dose perfectly. You cannot make changes during the cycle and expect anything to change. You can see here, if you start increasing on day seven, the doses, what are you achieving? Because this dose increase, will achieve a modified baseline level only on day 10. So it takes a good three days from seven to 10 just to stabilize the FSH, endogenous FSH levels. New recruitment, which you then achieve. So on day seven, you pumped in. There is no recruitment, new recruitment for three days. Day 10, you will have some new recruitment, but these newly recruited follicles will not achieve maturity until day 18. And the follicles you have already recruited in the beginning are going to be 18 mm much earlier. So what you are doing by this is just maybe adding on a few immature eggs to your cohort and not really increasing the number of mature oocytes. So please remember these knee jerk increases in doses on day seven doesn't work. Please start with the correct dose right in the beginning. What about high responders? Now that we've talked about normal responders, you have to just remember the three musketeer slide, very easy. A potential high responder, thin patient, PCOS patient, high AMH, high AFC, you don't have to think twice. Safety is first. All you have to do is select the antagonist protocol. Make sure that you don't give her HCG and use the agonist trigger. And you cannot do an embryo transfer. You just freeze all the embryos. And then in a subsequent cycle with either artificially prepared with estrogen progesterone or a natural cycle FET, uh, you try and get her the best optimal pregnancy rate. Of course, the freeze out story began with PCOS about uh, say five or six years ago when we first start, started doing it at our clinic, and this was our initial series in 2015, 127 patients, all classic PCOS, high AMH, high AFC. Uh, at that time, uh, we uh, thought 150, and we still feel 150 in high responders is an ideal dose. What I told you earlier was for normal responders, 0.2 milligrams agonist tryptorelin trigger for all these patients. No HCG was given to any of them because all of them had more than 15 follicles. Vitrification was done on day two at the four cell stage. Uh, next cycle, after the agonist down regulation, we did estrogen progesterone priming and then did a thaw embryo frozen transfer at the eight cell stage. And very high, almost a 57% pregnancy rate straight away in the first frozen embryo transfer in this otherwise very difficult category of patients. And lower incidence of early pregnancy losses and ectopics as compared to fresh transfers, giving you a net pregnancy take home baby rate of almost 50%. So, fantastic pregnancy rates for PCOS and high responders with this simple three musketeer approach antagonist cycle, agonist trigger, freeze all, estrogen progesterone prime transfer. Some of you might say, oh, what if I add back HCG? I don't have a very good vitrification program. I would strongly suggest that you improve your vitrification program rather than playing with the life of the patient. You can see here, you, if you add back HCG, like a lot of people have recommended, 1,500 on the day of egg retrieval and so on, you will see that, yes, your pregnancy rate will come back to the same 40-50% because your luteal phase was rescued and you have adequately functioning corpora lutea, but you have an unacceptably high incidence of OHSS and this is the uh, dangerous type of OHSS because these are the pregnant patients. The OHSS goes on for 15-20 days. I don't know how many of you have had this experience when we used to do it about 15-20 years ago. We used to have every week two or three admissions for SITs, pleural effusion and believe me it's a nightmare to treat these patients. And the last thing you want is a severe morbidity or a mortality in an IVF program. So please be careful. Uh, vitrification is not really difficult to do and it's absolutely not justified to do uh, fresh transfers with add back HCG when you have such good results with the freeze all program. 
another important thing to remember even if you give add back hcg a lot of patients who have more oocytes you can see here patients who have more than 18 oocytes have almost 16 to 20% of them will have a premature rise of progesterone on the day of hcg and we know that when this happens there is an advancement of the endometrium and that is not too good for ideal pregnancy rates so again some of you would say okay, oh i can start with a high dose and then reduce on day 7 if i see too many follicles does this help Again, please remember that once you discontinue or reduce a particular dose, it takes three days for the FSH concentration to fall below the threshold and to end new recruitment. So for another three days, your recruitment is going to continue. Although you psychologically feel, oh, I have reduced to 150, so now my number of follicles will go down. It doesn't work like that. So you can see here, even if you reduce the doses or even if you stop the injections, out of a fear of ovarian hyperstimulation, there is no improvement in safety. So you might feel, oh, the E2 levels have fallen, now I can give the trigger, but this does not reduce the incidence of OHSS, and also it will just compromise the oocyte quality and the embryo quality for you. Does frozen embryo transfer really help even if progesterone levels are high in, uh, on the day of HCG? Very classical study you can see here, pregnancy rates with fresh transfer in the presence of premature progesterone rise are pretty low as compared to the blue bars, which are the frozen embryo pregnancy rates, much, much higher, even in patients who have had a premature progesterone rise. So clearly, premature progesterone rise affects endometrial receptivity by advancing the endometrial. But histologically, you will not see it on ultrasound. And therefore, the pregnancy rates are lower than what you would get with a frozen embryo transfer. Personal experience, excellent with frozen embryo transfer. You can see here, 2018. Month after month goes on around 50 to 60 percent per cycle with a freeze all policy for most of these high responders. So, absolutely convinced that there is no other way to go. You need safety, you have to be OHSS free, and the three musketeer approach is the best for the high respond. That brings us to the third category, which is usually the chunk, the huge number of patients in your clinic, and those are the poor responders. Simple management, if you have to remember, in just one slide. There are three categories of poor responders. Leave aside the Bologna criteria and the Poseidon criteria. You have one patient who has a reduced number of FSH sensitive follicles. So these are your classical Poseidons 3 and 4. Young and old patients with low AMH, low AFC, they have a diminished reserve. So increasing your doses beyond a certain point is not going to help them in any way. The second category, the patient had adequate follicles which were sensitive to FSH but your dose was inadequate. So she needed 300 and you gave her just 150, and which is why you got a suboptimal response. The third category is the one where you have adequate number of follicles, your dose was adequate, but still you get a hypo response or a suboptimal response because these are the 20% who are carrying subtypes and they have FSH receptor polymorphisms of the FSH and beta LH receptors, which is why they don't respond as you want them to. This category, uh, usually addition of LH from the beginning of stimulation works wonders for this particular group of patients. So if you remember the physiology of poor ovarian response, treatment becomes extremely simple. So of course, I don't want to go too much into uh, these details here because it's such a whole lecture in itself. But this is simply put, you have groups 1, 2, 3 and 4. 1 and 2, to put it very easily, are young and old patients with a normal reserve to start with but they give you a suboptimal response. That is 1A if they give you less than four eggs, 1B if they give you four to nine, where you expected about 10 to 20 eggs. And group three and four, of course, are young and old patients who had a diminished ovarian reserve to start with. So they are the expected poor responders in your clinic. And these usually constitute 50% of patients. So this is a huge chunk, a huge problem. And this is where most clinics go wrong with the initial dosing whether to use only REC FSH or use uh, HMG or HP HMG or LH activity and so on. So it's very important that you, are, you uh, recognize these groups and learn how to identify and stimulate them in the best possible manner. So for management of groups one and two, that is the difficult category, young and old, who did not give you the kind of response that you wanted. The usual reasons are of course under treatment, polymorphisms and so on. But I believe that the number one cause here, especially with the antagonist protocol, is asynchronous development. Very often we feel, oh, today is day three, it's okay, we can start. There's nothing like, okay, we can start. The minute you reach day three, although literature says you can start on day two, day three, day four, 
remember that the recruitment of the dominant follicle has already occurred now when you start your fsh on day 3 you are a bit late that follicle is going to race ahead the other follicles are going to stay behind now if it's a normal responder with 15 20 oocytes maybe it doesn't make a much of a difference but in these categories where you are just getting 4 to 9 oocytes or less than 4 oocytes it makes a huge difference and that is where pre treatment is very important to make sure that you get a uniform cohort my personal favorite right now is the use of the antagonist on day 2 3 and 4 and then begin stimulation from day 5 because we are more or less a 365 day center so we don't need too much of pushing forward unless i have to go for a conference or whatever it is next weekend then i just need to play those two or three days estradiol pre treatment works beautifully too and norethisterone also works well also prefer the agonist protocol i told you the agonist gives you a much more uniform cohort because you have completely suppressed the axis there is no endogenous recruitment of the follicle till you don't start your exogenous fsh hmg and that is why it will always give you a better uniformity of the cohort than the conventional antagonist protocol and of course if you feel you underdosed her then you can increase the dose or you can add lh or use hmg instead of fsh in a subsequent cycle so these are the usual ways estradiol you can see here a pre treatment 2 mg twice a day from day 25 she gets her menses at the usual time but you don't want to start stimulation you continue with the estradiol she will stop bleeding the triple line endometrium will form but there will be no recruitment of any dominant follicle because of the negative feedback of estradiol then when you want to begin fsh you can't pull for more than 9 days with this approach a day before you stop give her the last estradiol on say day 8 and from day 9 you begin fsh or hmg The second simple way of doing it is to use norethisterone. You just give her norethisterone five milligrams twice a day from cycle day twenty. Minimum seven days, maximum fourteen days. Stop anywhere between the seventh and the fourteenth day. Expect menstruation in three or four days, and then begin. Usually after a five-day pill-free interval, we begin the FSH or HMG, and again you will get a beautifully uniform cohort of follicles. And this is what I showed you earlier. Just give antagonist. If she comes to you in a natural menses. you feel that one follicle or small follicle or cyst is seen in one of the ovaries which might give you a, a asynchronous cohort or you want to push forward by two or three days to avoid the next weekend you just give her the antagonist on day 2 3 and 4 and begin stimulation from day 5 and you get a perfectly uniform cohort of follicles there is also a lot of new research by a uh, blockil uh, uh, published in 2018 that serum progesterone not only on day of hcg but also on day 2 is very important when you start and there are a lot of patients who have progesterone more than 1.5 on day 2 and in this category also it is very important to give the antagonist on days 2 3 and 4 to reduce the progesterone level and then begin your fsh stimulation to make sure that you get the perfect cohort so this is now i think what should be routine especially for clinics who just need to play with cycles say 2 or 3 days and don't want to do batches or you know get together 10 15 patients at the same time oc pill like i showed you this lot of meta analysis lower ongoing pregnancy rates prolonged duration of stimulation uh, too much of gonadotropin consumption number of oocytes retrieved also lower all when you use oc pills and the problem is that if you have given 20 days 30 days like a lot of people do for batch ivf then you are likely to not get a perfect cohort of top quality embryos also in high responders remember especially egg donors most of them have taken oc pills have been put on oc pills by the agencies so that whenever any clinic calls for a donor they just make them stop the pill and come now remember these are potential high responders and you don't want any complication with an egg donor so most clinics will expect 15 20 25 eggs from an egg donor and most of them will use the agonist trigger now the agonist trigger requires a good stock or supply of endogenous fsh lh if you have suppressed this fsh lh endogenously uh, the endogenous one too much with oc pill pre treatment you will not get an ideal conversion to metaphase 2 oocytes so very often you find that in your normal patient you use the agonist trigger you get 20 oocytes 18 metaphase 2s in egg donors very often you find 20 follicles only 10 oocytes only 2 ampules this happens because they have taken oc pill pre treatment for a long time and you can see here the higher the lower the levels of lh at the start of stimulation because of over suppression the higher is the risk of a suboptimal response with your agonist trigger so you can see almost 40% of patients with over suppressed lh will not give you a good supply of good quality oocytes when you use an agonist trigger so this is a very very important practical point 
not given in any book, but you have to learn it the hard way. That make sure your egg donors don't take OC pills. You can call them in on their natural cycles, give them the antagonist on day two, three, four, or you can tell them to take estradiol valerate from day 25, or you can give norethisterone. You have so many options. There is no need to put them on long 20 days, 30 days, 40 days of OC pills, and then end up with a bad quality oocyte or embryo. In poor responders, also whether agonist is better or antagonist is better, we have a lot of data now rejuvenating the agonist protocol. You can see a huge study here comparing 600 patients in each arm and you can see the agonist doing extremely better in terms of number of oocytes, number of embryos, clinical pregnancy rates, live birth rates, all statistically significantly higher with the agonist as compared to the antagonist which has been very popular. In our own very particular study which I did and probably the best control study ever done because we did both the protocols in the same patient. So our control is not another patient. Unlike all the literature which is published, like I showed you the previous slide, 600 patients of agonist, 600 patients of antagonist, they are different patients. Here we had the same patients, 36 patients, all were poor responders with a low AMH. First cycle antagonist or second cycle agonist or vice versa. The most important point here was there is a definite increase in the number of oocytes. More important than that, you have almost a doubling in the percentage of top quality embryos. So you have 30% top quality embryos with the agonist when we use uh, agonist with HMG as compared to the antagonist protocol. So you can see here poor quality embryos significantly higher in antagonist as compared to agonist in poor responder patients. So this was a big eye opener for us which made us to switch completely to the agonist with the HPHMG, contrary to all conventional thinking where we were told that agonist causes oversuppression, a poor responder is already suppressed, you are oversuppressing, you will not get that many oocytes. In fact, it's quite the contrary. But the trick is, of course, to start and continue entire stimulation with HPHMG and not just use pure FSH in these patients. So it's very important that once you do this, you will expect a more uniform cohort, therefore you get more oocytes, you get more mature oocytes and you get more top quality embryos with the agonist. How much can you go high with the FSH dose? Very important points here. In groups 1 and 2, remember that you just need to increase the dose by about 75. So if you gave her 150, you go up to 225. If you gave her 225, go up to 300. You don't have to double or jump. Like if you were on 225, you don't have to make it 450. Do we have evidence for that? Yes, you can see here. You just increase the dose by about 75 and you have a significant increase in the number of oocytes retrieved. Now, a lot of you would ask me that how does it matter if the patient gives six oocytes or seven oocytes? Does it really matter? For a poor responder, it does. You can see here, live birth rates increase with each additional oocyte that you retrieve. So with one oocyte, you have a live birth rate of 4%. With two, it's up to nine, then 12, 16, and 22. You can see each additional oocyte that you get, metaphase two oocyte that you get, will improve the pregnancy rate significantly for a poor responder patient. Groups three and four, on the other hand, of course, they don't have the follicles. So here, going up higher with any amount of dose is not going to get you more eggs. You have to remember that in these women, Poseidon 3 and 4, any amount of higher dose of gonadotropin will not compensate for the follicles which are just not there. These patients don't have follicles. You cannot manufacture new follicles by giving her 450, 600 and 900 IU of FSH or HMG. So here again, the treatment strategies are a bit different. And you can see, again, agonist compared to the antagonist, a huge study from 2018 for Poseidon group 3. Those are young patients, which is very common now. We get more and more patients in their early 30s with very low AMH, low AFC. And you can see the agonist, again, gives a much, much more than a double live birth rate. And this is purely because you get a more uniform cohort. And in these poor responders who are giving you just three or four eggs, getting four metaphase 2, is better than getting one metaphase 2 site and that is how the agonist scores over the antagonist for this group of patients. Again, to highlight the point, whether you give 300, you give 450, you give 600, is there any difference? If you look at the live birth rates, they're absolutely identical. So increasing the doses beyond a certain point is absolutely futile and is not going to give you any increase in live birth rates. So please don't uh, please use your doses judiciously, especially in groups three and four, where you don't have the follicles and what should be a standard dose for this category is just 150 IU. So if you have just three or four follicles, 
150 IU is more than enough to sustain or maintain their growth and you don't need to uh, get increase to 300 or 450. Something which I'm really excited about currently is the dual stimulation and this is a very new concept here. You can see until now we always believed that one menstrual cycle has one follicular wave, a recruit, a wave of recruitment. It is now shown that almost 68% of women will have two waves of follicular recruitment within a menstrual cycle and one in three will actually have three waves of follicular recruitment. So this is the whole beauty with this new stimulation known as the dual stimulation and this was the first paper by Ubaldi of 51 patients all with poor uh, low AMH, low AFC, previous poor response and you can see stimulation was simple. Rec FSH and Rec LH is what he used from day two then the antagonist as usual only agonist trigger, even if you have just three follicles, no HCG, just give the agonist trigger. Retrieve oocytes at 36 hours, stop for three or four days, again begin stimulation, again the antagonist, again the agonist trigger and again the retrieval. So the second retrieval is usually during menstruation and you'll be surprised, you would feel how can she have follicles at that time. She is usually on day two, day three of menstruation and still you will get a beautiful cohort, a second cohort of eggs within the same menstrual cycle. Now all of you will immediately ask, what's the point? Why do you want to do this? You can always do it in the next month. It's not just that she is short of time because she is elderly or because she has low AMH and AFC, but look at this slide and you will see that the rate of getting a normal euploid blastosis is higher in the second half stimulation. It means your luteal phase stimulation, you have a 65% chance of getting a euploid blastosis as against just 42% chance with follicular phase stimulation. And this was the whole logic and the reasoning behind doing dual stimulation that in these very poor responders who often have no other choice but to go for a donor egg, this seems like a huge ray of hope for these patients because if you are getting better quality oocytes, more oocytes and more embryos in the luteal phase, it is definitely worth a try for these patients who wish to have their own genetic child. And I've completed about 20-25 patients now and almost in 90% of the patients, we get much more in terms of number and definitely more in terms of top quality embryos in the second half luteal phase stimulation as compared to the follicular phase. And it's almost miraculous or dramatic in some patients because even with AMH as low as 0.3, the follicular phase just gives you one oocyte and the luteal phase gives you four, five, six oocytes with two or three top quality embryos. It's absolutely dramatic. So this is definitely going to be the future for a lot of these patients with real bad poor responders. LH supplementation, of course, always controversial, but what is accepted now that all elderly women should be given LH from day one. Patients who have had a very slow growth of follicles, the one with polymorphisms, should be given from day six or seven, you add LH, or from day one in a subsequent cycle, once you know that she is a poor potential hypo responder. Of course, patients with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, everyone knows you have to give 300 HNG from the beginning. Poor responders, it was controversial until now, generally, but now it is accepted that you do get more oocytes and significantly higher pregnancy rates with HPHMG uh, with addition of LH as compared to the use of FSH alone. So when you use HCG-driven LH activity in your HMG preparation, there is an increase in the number of top quality embryos that you get. And also you can see when you give just LH, there is no accumulation in the system. So live birth rates are pretty steady at 10%. If you give HCG-driven LH activity, which is there in HPHMG, as HCG has a long half-life, it keeps accumulating. And as the HCG levels increase on day six, you have a drastic or tremendous increase in the live birth rates too. So again, you have to judiciously select which type of LH you need to use and what you want to give your patients. DHEA, there is no evidence that it works. What seems to be promising is, of course, testosterone. Again, most of the initial publications were of 20 days or so. But we now know that for best outcomes, it might be required to be given for about 60 days pre IVF. And you can see here, we are all awaiting the results of the T transport trial, which commenced in 2017, which is 60 days of testosterone pretreatment, followed by the long agonist protocol, and then the use of HPHMG, pretty much similar to what I have been doing, except the testosterone part, and then comparing the outcomes with a placebo. And hopefully, we should have something promising with testosterone here. Until the results are out, we right now recommend 20 days pre-stimulation of testosterone gel. So usually you begin it on day 5, day 6 of the preceding cycle. Call her in on day 2 of the stimulation cycle, which is when she would have completed 20 days. You stop and begin your FSH or HMG. Moving on to the trigger, 
Of course, a dual trigger is my personal favorite. That means you give both HCG 6500 of REC HCG and 0.2 milligrams of triptorelin instead of giving just HCG. And you can see here, especially in patient, patients who have given you less number of oocytes as compared to the number of follicles, you see a great increase, statistically significantly high increase in the number of eggs, number of top quality embryos, number of embryos, pregnancy rates and so on. Even for patients who give you less metaphase 2 sites, despite 10 follicles, you got only 4 M2s. Again, when you give the dual trigger in these patients, you get a significantly higher and much better outcomes. And even in poor responders, you can see that this was a group which received only HCG. This received the dual trigger from 2019 and clearly it does much better in terms of all outcomes as far as fertilization rates, live birth rates, clinical pregnancy rates and so on are concerned. So dual trigger is the way to go for most categories except high responders where you would obviously give just the agonist and not give HCG. So just to summarize then, a pre-treatment usually coenzyme Q, resveratrol, ARG9 for two months, testosterone for 20 days, this is for poor responders. First choice protocol, long agonist with HPHMT 300. Second choice, you can use estradiol pre-treatment or antagonist pre-treatment. You can give clomiphene from day 2 to 10, uh, then REC FSH with HPHMG combination with the antagonist and dual trigger. Dual stimulation, I'm particularly excited about this and might soon be my first choice protocol for poor responders. Fresh transfer if progesterone is in normal levels on the day of HCG and you have two top quality embryos. Anything outside of that, better to do freeze all and embryo accumulation. So, of course, there are indications for freeze all as this and that I'll be coming to later on again, the same slide. So, to summarize the ovarian stimulation part, of course, we know that the aim is to collect multiple good quality oocytes. A poor response, which again depends on your initial starting dose, will give you low pregnancy rates. Excessive response will increase your risk of hyperstimulation. So, you have to have judiciously selected that, okay, this patient needs an antagonist protocol with an agonist trigger and the three musketeer approach. Higher number of oocytes will give you higher number of top quality embryos, will give you higher cumulative live birth rates and pregnancy rates. But you have to remember that higher number of oocytes also cause elevated premature rise in progesterone, which will affect your pregnancy rates in a fresh cycle, but not in a frozen cycle. Poor responders, starting dose is crucial, more than 300 to be avoided. Adjuvants, we are not sure whether they really help. Dual stimulation seems to be promising. Normal responders, 200 to 225 is probably the best dose. High responders, antagonist, agonist trigger and freeze all is the way to go. So this is of course just to summarize what I've already told you and we then move on to the second half and that is what is more important today is about a few things about embryo transfer which all of you should know. We know that successful implantation requires a good embryo, a receptive endometrium and a perfect transfer technique and of course the goal of a successful transfer is that you should be able to deliver embryos in the most atraumatic manner possible to the site of maximal implantation in the uterus, which is usually about one centimeter short of the fundus. One to 1.5 centimeters below the fundal endometrium is the site of maximal implantation potential. A lot of you would think, oh, it just takes 30 seconds. My embryologist does the transfer. How important is it? If you look at the causes of recurrent implantation failure, poor embryo transfer technique may account for as many as one third of all IVF failures. So this is something which you cannot take lightly. And this is the reason there is a difference in pregnancy rates between centers uh, and between clinics in the same city or same town, even if they're using everything similar, the same drug, same culture media and similar equipments. Why is there a difference in pregnancy rates? Embryo transfer technique is one of the key factors involved in this. So just to show you how I do, because a lot of people want to see how I do embryo transfer, I always hold the anterior lip with an ellis, contrary to all textbook teaching that you should not hold the cervix. I don't aspirate any endocervical mucus or do anything else, just wipe clean the external os. Then we introduce the outer sheath of the embryo transfer set. So I use the after loading technique, means I first make sure I have crossed the internal loss of the cervix, I then rush back to the lab. Uh, I then load some culture medium to flush the catheter and rinse the catheter, which is very important so that the embryos don't stick inside the catheter. And then load the embryos. So the medium is already there, preloaded in the catheter, then take some air, then take some medium with the embryos, then again take some air, then some medium. It just takes a few seconds. Then I rush back to the transfer room, thread the inner catheter through that outer sheath. Very easy. Then there are markings to show you where you are at the same time of course your ultrasound is also on 
So you can look at the screen, go in. I've already injected, withdraw the catheter. There's no need to wait and hold on and do anything of that. Make sure on ultrasound that the embryos have been deposited at that one centimeter. You can see here the inner catheter proceeding and transfer the embryos just one centimeter short of the fundal endometrium. So this is how, how simple embryo transfer looks. And you have to be, of course, as I told you, Holding the cervix with a very thin bite usually helps to steady the cervix and straighten the canal with gentle traction. And of course, I'll show you the more, more details in subsequent slides. So a lot of parameters will affect the outcome of embryo transfer, such as the angulation, the antiversion, retroversion, uh, the contractions that you may stimulate with a bit of rough treatment, placement of the catheter at the right place, how forcefully you inject with the piston, whether you should have ultrasound guidance for all, the volume of fluid in which you have loaded the embryos, the quality of the embryos, the number of embryos, these are all important parameters to help you with a good successful transfer. We don't want a difficult embryo transfer. And that is very important. What is a difficult transfer when you need manipulation? You need multiple attempts. You just can't negotiate the internal loss. Sometimes you have to dilate and you cause all kinds of trauma and bleeding. And these are the patients who are unlikely to conceive. As you can see here, it's an almost a 20 year old study that an easy transfer will give you almost a double pregnancy rate as compared to difficult transfers. The commonest reason for a difficult transfer is always cervical angulation. So that is the main problem here. Or a long cavity or a short cavity which you have not pre-noted in your notes in the file and you are caught unaware and you deposit the embryos thinking it's a normal UCL and then you find out oh she had a fibroid and the fundal endometrium is far away and so on. And because of a difficult transfer, the commonest problem which occurs is inducing of uterine contractions, which will then almost kind of expel or throw out the embryos. So you have to make sure that you don't have a difficult embryo transfer to help you in your early days. A mock transfer in the preceding cycle always helps. You can note down the direction of the cavity, the depth of the cavity, how much of antiversion retroflexion is there. Does it go easily or do you need a stillette and so on. Ultrasound also helps to exactly measure the length of the uterine cavity and the cervical canal to evaluate the angle to make sure there is no false passage. Now a lot of patients have false passages because especially in centers like us where they've come after maybe one or two laparoscopies, hysteroscopies, DNCs, maybe two, three IVF failed cycles. A lot of them have false passages and it is very important. I've had two or three pregnancies per year where they have failed five or six cycles in the past because embryos were transferred in the wrong cavity. So please make sure that you are not entering a false passage. And that is where ultrasound evaluation really helps to make sure that you don't make those kind of mistakes. When to do the mock ET? Suppose you forget to do it in the previous cycle. Can you do it on the day of egg retrieval? Yes, you can. She is already under anesthesia. Even if you put in a, say, a small a soft round headed uh, sound or something on the day of egg retrieval, it is not going to cause any endometrial trauma. And you can see here pregnancy rates are the same, clinical pregnancy rate 55, 53. So doing a mock transfer on the day of retrieval is not too late and not going to damage the endometrium. You can safely proceed with that. Ideally, of course, you should do it in the previous cycle or on day two of menstruation. Uterine contractions are usually stimulated if you go and touch the uterine fundus. So that is something you should not be doing. With modern day soft ET sets, of course, things have become easier. We don't really have to go uh, that high. And uh, even if you do touch the fundus, the catheter is so soft that it doesn't induce any contractions. Remember, fresh transfers are associated with stronger contractions than frozen transfers. So this is a very important point. Once again, a brownie point for frozen transfer. Progesterone levels on the day of transfer also correlate well with contractions. As I told you all textbooks, but these are really olden times when they didn't really know where things were going wrong. So they said, don't apply a tenaculum or a valsalum. Difficult transfer obviously increases contractions and they say blastocyst transfer again is associated with lower uterine contraction. But the main three take-home points, avoid touching the uterine fundus, use soft catheters, best placement is at one to two centimeters from the fundus and not too close to the fundus. Relaxants don't really work and most of them don't improve pregnancy rates. There was a lot of hype about Atosiban, but again, there's no documented uh, RCTs on that. And this paper clearly says that it may help in some women with repeated implantation failures. But again, we need to verify these findings in larger and well-designed studies. So at the moment, we don't really, we are not high on uh, uterine relaxants. Failure to negotiate the internal loss, what can you do? Ultrasound guidance helps in that tremendously. A full bladder will help to straighten the uterocervical angle. 
You can then, of course, mold the outer sheath of the embryo transfer catheter specifically to negotiate the canal and the angle. Or you can, if the soft set does not pass and if you have a rigid one in stock, you can use that. What I like to do is you uh, have a self-made uh, malleable guide wire, which I'll show you subsequently, which you can design and get it uh, fabricated for your ET sets. You just have to pass it through the outer sheath, give shape to the outer sheath, and it will usually 9 out of 10 or 99 out of 100 negotiate the internal loss of the cervix. Alice, applying the Alice with a small bite, of course, always helps to straighten the canal. If really, really difficult and with all this you just can't get in, then maybe it's best to not do the transfer, perform cervical dilatation or maybe a hysteroscopic resection of the internal loss or something like that. And then do, uh, of course, the textbook, theoretically they say transfer under hysteroscopic guidance, but it's very difficult and I'm not uh, too experienced with doing that. So this is how we made a guide wire. You can see this is very simple. It should be malleable. This is the set which is pre available to us, the outer sheath and the inner soft catheter. So you make this stillet, pass this stillet through the outer sheath, give this more rigidity and memory of shape as per the canal which you see on ultrasound and then negotiate the internal loss very easily once you use this kind of a malleable stillet. Some of you would say, oh, that would add to the trauma, pregnancy rates will go down. Look at this study here with cannulation, same pregnancy rates as without cannulation, despite more than half the patients having blood on the catheter. So blood on the catheter is not really to be taken very seriously because it's usually when you are withdrawing the inner set that some blood from the cervix might get onto the inner catheter and it is not necessarily because of trauma near the fundal endometrium. So don't take it too seriously and you don't really have to worry about using the stillet as long as you can put the uh, embryos in the right place. Too many catheters available in the market, so it's always confusing which one to use, which one not to use. Finally, it's your own experience. Personally, I prefer the Sydney soft sets, which I've been using forever since they were available now. And before that, we were using the Sydney rigid sets. And this is how the rigid set used to be. It was a very stiff catheter as compared to the new soft sets. The only advantage being that placement was much easier. It used to negotiate the internal loss like a cakewalk. But of course, there's endometrial disruption will occur in almost half your patients. So this is not acceptable. And which is why the rigid catheters went out of vogue uh, totally for this. Soft sets, of course, we know they have a lot of advantages. There's no trauma while passing through. They negotiate the angle much more easily. Uh, there's no excessive stimulation of the cervix and uterine contractions less likelihood of blood on the catheter and less likely to cause any endometrial disruption on its way up. So the catheter of the day is obviously the soft set, which all of us are using. Technique, I prefer the afterloading, which I showed in the video. It means first I like to put the outer sheath, make sure I have crossed the internal loss, then go and load embryos and come back to make life easy. And you can see here, even as this study shows, afterloading technique, clinical pregnancy rate are much higher than the direct technique where you the embryologist directly comes with both the outer sheath and the embryos loaded in the inner catheter, then comes, then both of you try and struggle and negotiate the internal loss. Many a times you can't do it. Then he has to go back, again put the embryos back, then you again turn on your ultrasound and things can get quite messy. So after loading, preferred technique to make sure that everything goes smooth. Loading, I told you earlier, of course, it has to be with gaps of air in between, medium air, embryos, air and medium. 20 to 30 microliters is best. Too much of fluid and you might push the embryo straight into the fallopian tube or they may regurgitate down into the cervix. Too little of fluid, the embryos might remain adherent in the catheter and not get expelled at all. So both not ideal scenarios. The best is 20 to 30 microliters. Piston pressure, very important. You inject with a particular amount of pressure which comes with experience. Don't release it till you have not withdrawn the catheter completely. If you do that, sometimes the embryos can get sucked back into the inner catheter and you may not even realize why the patient failed despite top quality embryos. So you have to make sure you are perfectly well versed with your BD syringe, which you use for transfer and use the right amount of pressure. As I showed you earlier, best transfer point is at 1, 1 to 1 1.5 centimeters from the fundus, higher pregnancy rates, much lower ectopic pregnancy rates as compared to if you inject within one centimeter of the uterine fundus. Ectopic pregnancies we know most often because of rapid force injection or too much fluid volume. Also, we know that progesterone and all those theories, I'm sure all of you are aware. But we know that more ectopics occur with difficult transfers as compared to easy transfers. So please be wary of this point and pre-counseling is very important. Uh, medical notices, medical legal problems are quite expected. If a patient has an ectopic which is then not diagnosed, she ends up with a rupture and loses the tube. 
or has to take a lot of blood transfusions, you are likely to get a legal notice. So please make sure that the consent forms cover this fact that ectopics can occur in IVF too. Of course, the person doing the embryo transfer is very important. And as this study, classical study showed, the same clinic, same lab, but 10 different gynecologists doing embryo transfers for their own patients. The person who did the worst transfer had a success rate of very low, 17%. The guy who did the best transfer had a success rate of as high as 53%. So this is how much technique is important. Ultrasound guidance, of course, we know that it is important. Uh, the disadvantages of not using ultrasound are that you might go and touch the fundus. You might not place the catheter properly. And of course, that may lower your pregnancy rates. On the other hand, when you use ultrasound guidance, you are facilitating the placement of the catheter. You can avoid touching the fundus because you know you have reached the point at 1, 1.5 centimeters short of the fundus. You can confirm placement with the air bubble which you see when you inject. Also, it allows you uh, to direct the catheter perfectly without disrupting the cavity. And when you use ultrasound, you need a full bladder, which itself helps in straightening the cervix and making transfer procedure easy. The indications for where you have to do ultrasound guided transfer, of course, the Dr. Google patient, there are patients who after failed, if you have not used ultrasound, tell you all other clinics are using ultrasound, you didn't use ultrasound, that is why I failed. Or if she has a history of difficult transfer in the past, or if it's a long uterine cavity, history of a previous cesarean section, because you might end up pushing the catheter into the LSCS scar, because there is usually a defect at that place. Patients with unexplained repeat recurrent implantation failures, or patients with a false facet in the cervix. So these are the cases where it's mandatory to use ultrasound. Whether to use for all normal patients is totally up to the operator. Disadvantages of ultrasound is, of course, you need a second operator who also has a PNDT registration. Longer procedure time, inconvenience of full bladder because within a few minutes the patient wants to pass urine and then they panic that, oh, I have passed urine, what if the embryos were expelled, I got up in five minutes. So there's a lot of psychological issues with the ultrasound guided transfer. Also, we don't have enough trials as of now to tell us that it is mandatory and that you will have improved pregnancy rates. So a lot of the initial studies, you can see all these are very old studies, said that ultrasound is better. You get higher pregnancy rates when you use ultrasound as compared to clinical touch. But if you look at this recent paper from Brussels, one of the last few papers on whether you should be using ultrasound guidance, if you have the same experienced operator who is doing all the embryo transfers, they compared in a double blind randomized control study, ultrasound group, blind group, same pregnancy rate. So if a patient, all patients are undergoing ET by an experienced operator, ultrasound guidance did not show in this study to have any benefit in terms of clinical pregnancy rate. So again, it's a personal choice. All of you, uh, you are at different levels of when you are learning or when you feel that maybe your pregnancy rates are not right because of a bad embryo transfer, you could look at ultrasound guided transfers routinely for all patients. But until then, at least stick to the ones where I showed you the indications. Acupuncture, of course, we know doesn't really improve pregnancy rates. Bed rest, again, not required. I have seen a lot of clinics where they admit the patient for a day, two days, even 15 days. In fact, there is a study which shows lower pregnancy rate if you have more than 10 minutes of rest. And if you make the patient immediately get up and study the air fluid interface, which you see at the site of embryo transfer, they saw in this study, 94% of patients less than one centimeter movement and just 4%, they had about more than four and more than four centimeter movement in just 2% of patients. So it should not, it's a wrong notion that if the patient gets up, the embryo will be expelled or it will move or it will be thrown away. It doesn't really happen. In fact, there are now even studies showing that even sexual intercourse during the peri embryo transfer and post transfer does not affect pregnancy rates negatively. So all these are now things of the past. We don't need bed rest. They can have intercourse. There's no problem. If you see the air bubble at 60 minutes post transfer, it means even if the patient has gotten up and become ambulatory, your pregnancy rates will be on par with the best clinics in the world. So remember that. How many embryos to transfer? Best is to follow the SALT and ASRM recommendations. For cleavage stage embryos, young patient, favorable prognosis means it's her first cycle. She has very good embryo quality. She has enough surplus embryos for freezing or she has had a previous live birth with a successful IVF at your own clinic. Just one to two embryos should be transferred. For the non-favorable, maybe two, and so on and so forth as per the age. Again, for blastocyst, favorable prognosis patients, just one blastocyst is enough. No need to put two, three, and four embryos for any category of patients because we still have this huge curse of multiple pregnancies. And this is a study from my own clinic. 200 of my consecutive pregnant patients were followed up by the Institute for Research and Reproduction, a central government institute. 
and they found pre multiple pregnancies very high at 45 percent of course this was 2016-17 published in 2018 preterm deliveries almost 70 percent now this is unacceptable in today's time this was the time when we were still transferring two or three embryos sometimes even four of course last two years we are down to not more than two embryos for any patient most young patients with a favorable diagnosis just one. single blastocyst is the way to go you can see here elective single embryo transfer first transfer pregnancy rate 44 percent if you put two embryos 58 percent this looks better but if you add one frozen transfer with again a single embryo your cumulative pregnancy rate is the same whether you do set or det so it's time now for us to start transferring just one embryo especially in good prognosis patients for poor prognosis patients sky is the limit you can see here for bad patients 35 plus patients poor quality embryo patients you can see that with each additional embryo that you put you have better outcomes and the chance of a better outcome increases by 28 percent and so on so in elderly women and those with average or poor ivf prognosis the study shows that you can put two three or even four embryos and still not have a very high multiple pregnancy rate finally of course a topic very close to my heart please remember that despite all our advances on the clinical side and in the laboratory side 65 percent of our cycles with fresh transfer do not give you a live birth so your live birth rate with fresh transfer as the start data here clearly shows whatever your initial diagnosis fresh transfer pregnancy rates always struggle in the range of 25 to 35 percent which is just not acceptable to the modern day patient most of the failures a lot of them despite good embryos good endometrium is because your endometrium has got out of sync and this is because of supraphysiological e2 levels and maybe high or low progesterone levels on the day of hcg which you cannot see on ultrasound you will see a nice triple line you will see good color flow but you don't have your pregnancy and that is because with fresh transfer a lot of patients fail because of the very high estradiol and progesterone levels also we are now worried of the safety of pregnancies from fresh transfers we know with fresh transfers there is a higher incidence of early pregnancy loss and miscarriages and tubal pregnancies higher incidence of preterm labor higher incidence of biochemical pregnancies poor or obstetric and perinatal outcomes and the danger of late onset pregnancy induced hyperstimulation what is freeze all it means you freeze all viable embryos not just the second best and you don't do any fresh transfer but transfer them in a subsequent cycle and do we have evidence for this this paper uh, uh, published in 2016 the risks which are reduced with frozen transfer are of low birth weight placental abruption previa biochemical ectopic pregnancies and early pregnancy losses this is the evidence we have increased risk with fet just to mainly one is placenta accreta but in the last six or seven years since we switched to freeze all we've had just two cases of placenta accreta so i don't think that's really a major problem and both were in surrogate mothers who had had previous cesarean sections so maybe that is a high risk uh, group or category where you have to be careful but in your normal ivf patients it doesn't really happen macrosomia if you look at there are only two papers published and the difference in weight is just plus 200 grams when you compare to fresh embryo transfer so i don't really see significant risk of course, we'll subsequently discuss the PIH, which is still a problem with frozen transfers. What about the risks of vitrification on the newborns? Again, we have this huge paper from 2016, uh, 1,600 and 900, almost 1,000 plus uh, pregnancies. And clearly there is no increase in malformation rate with vitrification and frozen embryo transfer. So safety is well established. We've already seen these slides before. So you can see here premature progesterone rise and which is why i keep coming back to that that when the progesterone on the day of hcg is more than 1.5 whether it's an agonist cycle or an antagonist cycle you have a drastic reduction in the pregnancy rates so 1.5 is usually the cutoff above which we prefer to do a freeze all <coughs> and not do a fresh transfer and also if you the number of days when progesterone is high prior to the day of hcg also reduces pregnancy rates so if you have more than three days of high progesterone your pregnancy rate will be lower than 20% as compared to 42.6% with no premature progesterone rise. The, what does premature progesterone rise do? Well, it causes endometrial advancement histologically. And if this advancement is of more than three days histologically, your pregnancy rate is almost down to 0%. So this is very important to remember that frozen embryo transfer will give you higher pregnancy rates than fresh when you have elevated progesterone on the day of HCG. Even in endometriosis, remember, 
fresh transfer clinical pregnancy rate 12 a frozen transfer up to 18.2 percent as this paper showed we now know that you don't need down regulation for the egg retrieval in endometriosis this is a very common mistake that everyone makes they think that endometriosis means you do your surgery give three months of depot preparation uh, down regulator completely and then do IVF to get best quality sites. It's quite the contrary. Too much of suppression, in fact, is not conducive for a good response because most of these patients have very low AMH levels to start with. Do a good surgery if required and of course, as per well as those indications for endometrioma surgery prior to IVF. Then immediately proceed with your antagonist or agonist stimulation as per the Poseidon groups and the data I showed you earlier. Get the maximum number of top quality embryos frozen then downregulate her in the transfer cycle. So downregulation is required in a transfer cycle for endometriosis and not for the retrieval cycle. Also thin endometrium we know is another common category where you need time to work on the endometrium. You need to sometimes do a scratching. You want to give her high dose estradiol, sildenafil, aspirins, heparins. You want to put GCSF or PRP into the uterine cavity. For all this, you need time. You can't do it in a fresh cycle. Sometimes, and that is why you need an FET, sometimes during your stimulation, you find a polyp or a septum or something you had missed earlier. You don't want to cancel the transfer. You just do a freeze-all, do a hysteroscopy on the day of egg retrieval under the same anesthesia, correct this pathology. Then you don't have to wait. A lot of people think if you do a hysteroscopy and remove a polyp or a septum or a thin endometrium, you have to then wait for two, three months before you do the transfer. It's quite the contrary. You can do transfer immediately in the subsequent cycle. And you can see the implantation rates are the same as patients who did not have a hysteroscopy on the day of egg retrieval. So you don't really need to wait. You just tell her, okay, okay, I'm not doing the fresh transfer. You have a polyp, which I didn't see earlier. Freeze the embryos, remove the polyp on the day of, at the same sitting as the retrieval. Get her menses. Within 15, 20 days, do the frozen transfer and you get your same pregnancy rates back. So uh, just to briefly dwell on this slide, which are the patients who benefit with freezol? One is, of course, if your progesterone levels on day of HCG are very low, is also a category which requires freezol or very high. Any patient who has had a previous early miscarriage or a biochemical pregnancy with fresh ET, just straight away do a frozen transfer. Any patient who has had a previous ectopic pregnancy in IVF with fresh transfer, again do frozen transfer. Poor responders where you are accumulating embryos or doing dual stimulation where you are accumulating embryos, you have to do frozen transfer. Endometriosis, I showed you, does better with FET. When you need to do PGS, PGD, obviously you have to biopsy the blastocyst, freeze the blastocyst, wait for seven or eight days to get the PGD report and then do a frozen transfer in the next cycle. If you inadvertently have missed a polyp, then of course high responders where you are giving an agonist trigger, you have to do a FET. Patients with a thin endometrium because you need to you need 20-25 days to work on the endometrium and patients with repeated IVF failures. So again to show you, with a freeze-all policy, success rates are extremely good and even 2018-2019, the same story continues. You can consistently expect more than 50% chance of pregnancy and these are difficult patients who have failed multiple fresh cycles in the past. So FET really works. Freeze all really works for these particular categories of patients. The biggest concern with FET has been that there is an increase, almost a double incidence of pregnancy-induced hypertension. So the odds ratio, 1.82 times higher risk of PIH with FET. Now, we didn't know the exact reason until recently, and it is now known that is it whenever there is more corpus luteum in a transfer cycle, that there is a higher risk of PIH, and it is now proved, yes, that's true that there is an increased risk of PIH in the absence of a corpus luteum. Now, when you do an FET, you usually downregulate, you give her artificial estrogen progesterone, so there is no corpus luteum, you have suppressed ovulation, and that is probably the reason why we had double the incidence of PIH. <clears throat> a lot of you ask me, what is my protocol for FET? We give the depot, agonist depot on day 21. We have been doing that all this time. We now have evidence that this was probably useless. Day three, day four, once you ensure that complete shedding has occurred, you begin estradiol valerate, maybe six to 12 milligrams a day, not more than that. Maybe with your sildenafils, vaginally and your aspirin. Maybe on day 14, day 15, you assess the endometrium. If it is not adequate, we don't like to step up the oral doses and we like to add the gel form of estrogen. Again, to make sure that she's not getting a total of more than 12 milligrams. Again, after a week or so, you assess the endometrium. If it is still not ideal, you do an intrauterine GCSF or a PRP, whatever you prefer to do. 
Again, wait four days, maybe by day 25, the endometrium would be ideal. Start progesterone and we normally give one more day than the stage of the embryo. So if it's a day three embryo, I like to give four days of progesterone. If it's a day five blastosis, I like to give six days of progesterone and then do the transfer. So you don't have to worry about the length of the follicular phase when you do a down-regulated FET cycle. Now, what has changed since then? And this was a study published in 2014 that shows that if you use patients with agonist depot and without depot, just estrogen progesterone from day two, the pregnancy rates are the same. And the incidence of a premature progesterone rise, which you thought you would suppress with use of the agonist, of course, it's 0%. But even if you don't use the agonist, it is just 2%. So we need a little bit of rethink here. And maybe every patient does not need the agonist suppression in a transfer cycle. And a lot of the initial studies were in favor of the agonist, which is why we started using it. But the recent studies, uh, Coch uh, the Cochrane database finally says that it may not be required in all patients. How many days can you give? Instead of, like I showed you, I go up to day 25. That may be just about right. If you go beyond 28 days, you can see that there is a reduction in the pregnancy rates. So you have from 40%, you go down to about 35%. Also, if you have more than 35 days of estradiol, you have an increase in the early miscarriage risk. So here you can see 28, 31, 34, increase to almost 50% if you have given more than 35 days of estradiol prior to transfer. So keep your cutoff at about 25 days to be on the safe side, to get the optimal pregnancy rate and have a low miscarriage rate. How many days of progesterone? I told you I give five, four days. I've always given one day. It's very easy to remember. One day more than the stage of the embryo. And we have this study from Blockhill from 2016 comparing three days of progesterone versus five days of progesterone for a day three embryo, eight cell embryo. And obviously, as expected, the three days is not going to do too well because I think it's inadequate. And you can see here, pregnancy rates are definitely higher with the five day progesterone. You have much higher pregnancy rates and statistically significant lower early pregnancy losses and miscarriages if you give more days of progesterone as compared to just three days. What about the blastocyst? In the blastocyst, again, they compared five days of progesterone versus seven days of progesterone. I don't know why they didn't look at six days, which is what I normally do. And if, as some of you might think, it may be the same as the cleavage stage, but surprisingly, it's the reverse here that the five days does better. You have a better pregnancy rate, although it did not reach any statistical significance, but five days is good. Seven days may not be the best in terms of uh, pregnancy rates with this group. And then we had a study comparing six days and seven days of progesterone. And as expected, as I've always been recommending, you have better pregnancy rates and uh, with the six days of progesterone. Although in this particular study, the final live birth rate was the same in both but some of the parameters were better with six days of progesterone. So six seems to be the right way of doing things in a blastocyst transfer. This is the study which showed that progesterone level on the day of transfer is important in an FET cycle. And you can see here, if the progesterone is less than nine, you have suboptimal clinical pregnancy rates. Anything more than nine, your pregnancy rates will be pretty high in the range of 60 to 70%. But low progesterone on the day of HCG uh, on the day of transfer is not too ideal in an FET cycle. Which brings us to the question that which is the best method of preparation? You can see here uh, studies of comparing natural cycle with uh, HRT, with agonist and all the methods which we described earlier. And this database concrete analysis says that there is no evidence to support any one in preference to another. But I still feel and a lot of uh, we as I have started now doing more and more natural cycle FETs. It definitely the odds ratio the risk ratio, LSCS, PIH, and placenta accreta are much higher with hormone replacement FETs as compared to natural cycles. So there is a point here, especially to reduce the rate of LSCS, PIH, and accreta, that maybe natural cycle is going to be much better than artificially prepared. And some of you would say, then what about the PCOs who don't ovulate? How can you do a natural cycle? So there you can do a minimum ovarian stimulated cycle. And again, ongoing pregnancy rates are better than an artificial cycle in this category of patients too. Everyone has this notion that once you do a pickup, say in January, you have to give rest to the ovaries in February and then do a frozen transfer in March or April. I never saw the logic in that and always felt that you should do it in the immediate next month and that's what I've been doing for the last six or seven years. So January is the pickup, February is the frozen embryo transfer. And we now have a paper from 2016 
which compares this that which is better and most of you would think that of course delaying would be better because all the corpora lutea and everything has settled down but it's quite the contrary you can see the blue bars are the immediate transfer the gray bar is after a one month delay you can clearly see the blue bar does much better on all counts so an immediate frozen transfer seems to be much better than delaying it beyond the next cycle Something I strongly believe that does the stage of the embryo really matter because a lot of patients tell us why didn't you do blastosis, why didn't you do day two, day three. If the endometrium preparation is the same, which it is in FET cycles, in all cycles, you can see here we compared day three frozen embryo transfer versus blastosis frozen embryo transfer. These are all own egg patients. And in egg donation, embryo donation, we continue to do fresh day two transfers. So day two Day three, day five, we are comparing all top quality embryos transferred. These are patients with own eggs. These are the third party. Endometrial preparation is the same in all three. The days of progesterone, one day more than the stage of uh, the embryo. And you can see clinical pregnancy rates are absolutely identical. So I firmly believe that more than the stage of the embryo, it is the endometrial receptivity which is important to finally determine your pregnancy rate. Am I advocating freeze-all for all? No. We know as per this paper here, that for less than 10 eggs, freeze-all and fresh give you the same pregnancy rates. We know 10 to 15 oocytes, freeze-all might be better and give you higher pregnancy rates than fresh embryo transfer. And of course, more than 15, anyway, you don't want to do a fresh transfer because of the risk of OHSs. So to end, of course, current recommendations, freeze-all for all high responders goes without saying. Normal responders, now we need to fine-tune this. Some studies say 10 is the cutoff, some say 13 is the cutoff, some say 15 is the cutoff. Obviously, patients with high progesterone on the day of HCG, patients with a thin endometrium, we are not sure of patients with less than 15 eggs, maybe fresh and frozen are the same. So there are many advantages in performing freeze-all. Of course, for high responders, patients with high progesterone levels, patients with thin endometrium, endometriosis, I showed you that list. But you have to also remember, not everybody has a good rectification program. It will increase your costs. It will increase the time to complete a cycle. You need special embryologists with special skills to make sure that you have 100% survival. So until you fine tune all that, you need to segregate the patients into fresh and frozen embryo transfers. So what are the evidence-based guidelines? And that's, of course, the last slide. Uh, difficult transfers will give you a lower pregnancy rate. Ultrasound guidance will result in easier transfers. Soft catheters preferred. Single embryo transfer to reduce multiple pregnancies. Trial transfers, especially in your learning days. Wipe clean the external loss. No need to aspirate mucus from the endocervix. Embryos to be deposited 1, 1 1.5 centimeters from the fundus. Do not try and touch the fundus. Negative pressure during catheter withdrawal should be minimized by maintaining pressure on the piston. Complete the entire procedure within a minute. IVF patients should be counseled about the possibility of ectopics and multiple pregnancies. Freeze all for all the indications I showed you. Fresh transfer, if you have less than 10, we don't know whether it's less than 15. For good prognosis patients, if progesterone is more than 0 0.5 and less than 1.5 on the day of HCG. So, of course, to end again, once again, I would like to thank MQR. Thank you, uh, Dr. Amit, Rajiv, and everybody on the MQR team. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I see that the attendance has been pretty much fixed at 380 without too many people leaving uh, during the presentation. So, thank you for a very patient hearing. Thank you so much. Uh, as always, this was a fantastic presentation and yes, people did uh, stick on and uh, there were a lot of comments, a lot of applauds for you, sir. Uh, with your permission, should we go for question and answers? I can read out the questions. So, uh, sir, I'll start with the very first question by Dr. Raman Deer Kaur. Uh, she's asking, in antagonist, what is ideal length of stimulation? It's not, there's no ideal length. Uh, basically, you have to go by the criteria of the follicular sizes. So once you have, don't start the antagonist too early is a very important point. So once on day seven, if you scan, if the follicle is 14 millimeters, you start the antagonist. Usually the patient is ready by day 11 or day 12. If on day seven, the follicles are very small, I would usually substitute, change from FSH to HMG. And again, SS after two, three days and then start the antagonist when she's 14. Sometimes egg retrieval may be as late as day 21, day 22, but the final outcome usually doesn't really change. So if you adhere to the principles which I told you of the follicular sizes, the trigger, the dual trigger, usually follicular, a lengthy follicular phase doesn't affect the outcome too much. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, hope Dr. Ramandir, this uh, has answered your question. So the other question comes from Dr. Rajesh Darade. He's, uh, no, no, he's complimenting you. The question comes from Aishwarya Nopur. Please guide how to do batching for FET. Batching for FET is very easy because uh, at least if you follow my old protocol that was giving the agonist depot to everybody on day 21 of the previous cycle, then each one gets her menstruation on a respective time. Then maybe the one who is gets her periods first might take say 30 days of estradiol and the one who gets it last may take 10 days of estradiol. As long as you get your triple line endometrium and all the parameters are favorable, you could do all your transfers on the same day or in a couple of days as per your batching. So it's quite easy to do. But the only problem is now if the one with 10 days, the endometrium is not ready, you want to do PRP and then wait, then obviously it's going to delay the procedure. So batch is not really the ideal way to go. But if you have to do it, then down regulation for all FETs is the best way out. If you go with natural cycles, it's impossible to do batch FETs. You just can't do it. Everybody will be on different days. Great. Thank you, sir. So the other question goes from Dr. Dev. Uh, he's saying, Dr. Jatin Shah, sir, uh, how would you utilize the half dose of depot agonist in your long agonist protocol? When do you start and how do you time the day one of stimulation? No, so we don't give the half depot. We give the daily subcutaneous during stimulation cycle. In a FET cycle, we give a depot. So there are two different things because in a FET cycle, over suppression doesn't really matter. So whether you give half or you give a full depot, it's both the same. In a stimulation cycle, we prefer to give daily subcute, which is why I said we give 0.5 ml daily. And once you start FSH HMG, you could continue 0.5 or you can reduce to 0.3.4. So it doesn't really matter, but some papers say that if you reduce, it's a better thing to do. And both, then you continue that with the FSH or HMG until the day of HCG. So the last shot of the agonist is on the morning of the HCG day. That day, obviously, you don't give your FSH or HMG. You give your night shot of the dual trigger or the FCG and then proceed with your active trigger. So it's pretty easy to do. In the FET cycle, we give a depot preparation, usually a full depot on day 21. Then she wait for her menstruation. Most depots will act for 21 to 30 days. So, and plus, once you start estradiol, that itself has a negative feedback, contraceptive type of effect. So there is no dominant follicle which comes if you once you do both these things. So it's uh, quite easy to do even in the FET cycle. Thank you, sir. Uh, so there's one interesting question which has come from Dr. Lalita Kambhampati. She's saying, sir, there are studies which showed decreased pregnancy rate after pre-treatment with estrogen. Please oh, elucidate. Right. Yeah, actually, though, that one slide I went through fast because I was I thought maybe we will be short of time. In fact, that shows that compared estradiol pre-treatment in two categories. One, like I told you, you stop the day before you start FSHMG. And the second group of patients where they continued estradiol until the day of HCG. And in these categories, they showed that the one which continued until the day of HCG had a higher pregnancy rate than where you stop it. But the pregnancy rates are not lower than in a normal stimulated cycle. So this latest study which has come is showing that pregnancy rates are excellent with estradiol. And even better if you continue the pretreatment till day of HCG and not stop when you start FSH stimulation. Okay, great. Thank you, sir. So there is another question from Dr. Niket Patel. He is saying, what is your opinion on dual and double trigger in normal AMD poor responder patients? Yeah, so yeah, it's the ideal way to give. So normally our policy is to give a dual trigger that is 6,500 like HCG with 0.2 milligram triptyrelin for all normal responders, all poor responders, Poseidons 1, 2, 3, 4. Whoever has less than 15 oocytes gets a dual trigger. Anybody who has more than 15 follicles gets only the agonist trigger. So it's very clear. Now, maybe uh, the person is trying to ask about the timings. Usually it is 36 hours, but there is one paper which shows that uh, maybe if you're doing pickup at 36 hours, you give the uh, agonist at minus 40 and the HCG at minus 34 hours uh, compared to the pickup time. So they say maybe that will give you a better crop. Although personally, I think it's not very easy to explain so much to the patient and you know to avoid any errors on their part. It's best to stick to the 36 hour pre pickup time for both the triggers. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. So, Dr. Meghashri Deshmukh is asking the next question Can't we give ANTAG on sixth day as fixed protocol in spite of 14 mm? No, no. So, that's not uh, ideal. No, if it is 14 mm, of course you start. So, the criterion should not be the fixed day of the cycle. The criterion should be the size of the follicle. Now, many a times, I told you 20% of patients are hypo-responders, means their follicles will not be 14 mm on day 7. They will just be 8, 10, 12 mm. 
They are the ones where you have to switch to HMG. They are the ones like someone asked, we'll have a prolonged follicular phase. If you start the antagonist too early, you are only increasing the problem for that patient and suppressing the response even further. So it's very important that you start antagonist only at 14 mm because the tendency to a premature LH surge only begins after 14 millimeters. So there's no point in giving it earlier than that. So there's no, all fixed protocols are out in almost all clinics. From the COVID point of view, I'm not sure whether, you know, we, we just to reduce one visit of the patient, we say, okay, day six, day seven, we start antagonist for all. So she doesn't have to come to the clinic. But then if they come on day 10, day 11, and you find the follicle is still just 10 mm, you wasted six shots of antagonist and you've not stepped up at the right time. So it needs to be balanced a bit. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, one question again from Dr. Dev, who is saying, there are studies which suggest that the trigger for poor responders should be given when the follicle size reaches 16 to 17 mm. Yeah. But there has been no guidance on how we should apply this. Will it work on all poor responders or only on Poseidon GP3 oblique 4? Your thoughts, please. No, so I've read that paper, but I don't, uh, I've not really followed it because I stick to my 18 millimeters. And nowadays we are doing dual stimulation for all Poseidon 3 and 4. So the last, of course, before the COVID thing started, we started in, I think, December or January doing the dual stimulation. So there it is uh, very clear that at 18 millimeters, two lead follicles of 18 mm. Sometimes if say 3 or 4 are 17.5, 17, it's just a half a millimeter, you know, what we are discussing right now. It's okay, like if it's a Sunday pickup and you want to do it on a Saturday and three follicles are 17.5, it's fine to give the trigger. It would not necessarily compromise the outcome. But ideally, I still feel at least two should dominant follicles, mean diameters if they are 18 millimeter, would be the best time to give a trigger even in a poor responder. Great, great. Thank you, sir. So Dr. Thuru Varul is asking a question, which AMH and AFC you consider as high responder? Yeah, so AMH uh, depends on if say she's under 35, normal BMI or a thin patient and AMH is say 2.7, 2.83. She is a potential high responder and if she's on a first cycle, I would not take a risk with the agonist protocol. But suppose I have a 37 year old with a same AMH of 2.7, but uh, AFC is not looking great and she's a bit on the higher BMI side, then obviously I would uh, prefer to use the agonist protocol for her. So if the whole choice a uh, potential high responder would be on an individualized basis. It's impossible to just have cut off that all AMH above 3 is high responder or all AFC above this is high responder. But you have to balance all the 4 or 5 things. So you have to see age of the patient, BMI of the patient, associated PCOS, endometriosis, previous response in a previous IVF cycle if she's done any, and of course your clinical evaluation of a, a, a enteral follicle count and AMH. So putting all this together, you then have to uh, uh, prognosticate that is she a potential high responder, normal responder or a poor responder. So there are, it's best not to have cut off values and go by an individualized basis. Uh, sir, there is one question from Dr. Shushma and she is having a present uh, case for you. Uh, I, I do batch IVF, planning to start on 5th of June. Hmm. PPT, a patient got menses today, planning for ANTAC protocol for this patient. How to fit her in this batch? No, no, fifth is what, retrievals or what is she? Uh, fifth, planning to start on 5th of June, batch. She, she is not saying uh, what like. Sorry, sir? She wants to start stimulation? Or, huh? I do batch IVF, planning to start on 5th of June, patient got menses today, planning to Okay, so she can give her norethisterone if she's got a period today, twice a day, until 30th of May is the easiest thing to do. So uh, this is one very interesting practical point, which is not written or published anywhere, but I do it routinely. It's very easy. So suppose you need something like this, you just give her a norethisterone, uh, a simple primolute or something like that. Just start twice a day from day two of her menstruation and just stop it five days before you want to start your batch. So accordingly, you have to calculate, like you say, 5th June, then maybe 30th, uh, 31st of May is the last tablet. Uh, she will bleed again on 4th June, just a little bit of spotting bleeding. There'll be no dominant follicle. And from 5th June, you can start the stimulation. So just norethisterone twice a day from today until five days before you want to start your FSH batch. Great. Thank you, sir. So one question on the dosing of FSH LH from Dr. Shri. She is saying when you are categorizing into normal or poor responders when you mean doses of 225 oblique 300 
if LH is needed to be added, how do you split the doses of FSH oblique LH? No, there is no uh, connection between the two. So if you want to say LH, if you are using recombinant FSH and LH and not HMG, then FSH dose remains the 225 or 300. And if she's a potential, if you feel she needs LH, usually for these normal responders, 75 IU is more than adequate. So with the 225 FSH, you give 75 LH. You can, we are not totaling 225 and 75 making 300. When we talk 225, we are talking of FSH, which is primarily the dose we are concerned with. Addition of LH usually in young normal responders is just 75 IU of REC LH from the beginning. And if it's a poor responder or an elderly woman, you can give 150 of REC LH from the beginning in addition to your 225-300 of FSH. So there are two different molecules and two different hormones. So you don't have to total up the dose to find say that that's the dose what I recommended. So the recommended dose what I'm giving you is for FSH. Whether you use FSH or HP, HMG or HMG, that should be the guideline. If you want to add REC LH to REC FSH, you add 75 to 150. You don't have to subtract that from the FSH dose. Okay. okay. Great, great. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, one question from Dr. Dev, a very practical one. What is your opinion on HCG-driven LH versus recombinant LH? In bracket, he also writes, despite what the pharma companies are leading us to believe. No, so, of course, it's an ongoing war, you know, since the last 10-15 years, ever since HPHMG came, every SA and ASRM, there is always conflicting views on both. But uh, just personal experience, I have found uh, excellent results with HPHMG, especially the HCG driven LH activity. And as I showed you the slides also, you have more top quality embryos uh, with the agonist protocol and HPHMG in poor responders. So these are things which we really need to take seriously. And uh, we've used a lot of REC FSH, uh, REC LH for 20 years. HPHMG we just started using last three or four years. Personally, I feel it has an edge because there is a cumulative effect of the HCG. HCG keeps adding up in the serum because uh, the half-life is seven days. LH is eliminated and excreted very fast. So there is no accumulation. And that is the biggest difference between the two molecules. So personally, I prefer HCG to an LH activity. The only drawback is the cost factor because it is even more expensive than REC FSH. So that is what most uh, gynecologists complain about that the cost is too high. So, but otherwise, uh, given a choice, if cost is not an issue, if the patient has failed two previous IVF cycles with the antagonist and REC FSH, I would place all my bets on a long agonist protocol with HPHM. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now I will go the questions from the reverse side, sir, because we have initially taken a lot of questions on stimulation. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Sudha Agarwal. She is saying, if ANA, ANA, is initially positive and later negative, and there is continuously bleeding in pregnancy, a case of RPL, how to proceed regarding heparin? So heparin though we continue, maybe the aspirin we don't give both. Some people give aspirin and heparin. So if she's just having little spotting and bleeding and if the pregnancy is progressing well, if there's no retroplacental clot and we normally proceed and continue with the enoxaparin. Sometimes very rarely if she has a heavy bleed, then we say, okay, you stop for three days and restart it. But it's best to continue and usually there's usually they settle down quite well. Of course, you can add your hemostats and your tanner, your uh, ethacyl and all those things also to first on everything else to try and stop the bleeding. But uh, it's not an indication to stop the heparin if it is just a mild spotting or mild bleeding every day. Only for a heavy bleed with a retroplacental uh, hematoma, then we stop it for three, four days, let the things resolve and then restart. Okay. Thank you, sir. One question which uh, looks to come from outside country. Uh, he's saying, did you depend on estradiol their levels or size of follicle to start antagonist. So size of the follicle. By follicular size, as I told you earlier, we don't do any serum mm -hmm. estimations whatsoever, except for patients with less than 10 follicles. And she is a first cycle. And you are thinking whether to do a fresh transfer or a frozen transfer. We do one progesterone level on the day of HCG. That is the first estimation we do. Estradiol estimations we have stopped doing totally for all patients because if you see more than 15 follicles, there is no question of uh, HCG trigger. Even if her E2 is 2000 or it is 20,000, you are not going to get OHSS with an agonist trigger. So just go ahead, give the agonist, freeze all and do a transfer. So you don't need to estimate E2 for that. Day 2 progesterone is now coming up in a big way. So what we need to add now to our system is to do a, do a day 2 progesterone because they are showing almost 15% of patients do have elevated progesterone on day 2. And that reduces the pregnancy rate drastically. So day two progesterone, if it is more than 1.5, give antagonist for three days, day two, three, four, and begin stimulation from day five. So as of now, 
The only hormones you need to check is of course AMH, prolactin, TSH before you start the cycle. Progesterone on day two to know whether you need to give an antagonist or not to reduce that progesterone level. Progesterone on day of HCG if you are contemplating fresh embryo transfer. For all other gay patients, there is no need to do any estimations. Just go ahead, freeze your embryos and do a cycle transfer in the next cycle. What you could add also is a progesterone day, uh, progesterone on the day of transfer in a FET cycle. As I showed you that slide, if it is less than nine, it is better to freeze the embryos and not proceed with the transfer because that endometrial will not be too receptive. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So one more question from Dr. Thiru Varul. He is saying when dual trigger is said to be advantageous than HCG alone, why don't we use routinely in all other than hyper responders? Which BMI do you take as cutoff to increase the gonadotropin dose, 25 or 35? And how much will you increase? No, again, I told you the doses is totally subjective because you can't take any one factor. You have to take everything into account, age, BMI, PCOS, endometriosis, AFC, AMH and previous response. So all these seven things you have to take into consideration before you decide a dose. So that is, uh, of course, very, very important to remember. And what are the first half? Sorry. Uh, so just a second, I just uh, <coughs> scrolled. Huh. The first of all, when dual trigger is said to be advantageous. Yeah, dual trigger is uh, ideal. So that's what I showed that you should be giving it to all patients and except high responders where you're doing a freeze all more than 15 follicles. Every other patient, normal responder, poor responder, Poseidon 1, 2, 3, 4, dual trigger is the best thing to give so that you get more oocytes, you get more metaphase 2 oocytes and you get more embryos for implantation. Great. Thank you, sir. So one question from Dr. Lalita. She says, can you talk about utilization of uterine artery Doppler and 3D endometrial volume before ET? No, I, I don't have experience with that. So normally we just do simple 2D ultrasound. And uh, most of the evaluation is completed before the cycle. And we don't do 4D estimations unless there is a lot of adenomyosis or something which requires that kind of assessment. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, should we continue? Tell me, I think it's 5.45 almost. Because uh, we have like 100 questions lined up and uh, we have almost done uh, 10, 12 questions. So, uh, a couple of questions more? Yeah, yeah. No problem. <laughs> uh, Dr. Jayashree Gaikwad is asking, what's the dose of FSH for group 3 and 4 with higher BMI? Yeah, so there you can go maximum 225. So 150 is ideal for the normal BMI. For higher BMI, 225. These are the two groups which don't have follicles. So all you need to do is support the growth of two or three or four or maximum five follicles if they have. Uh, so even in the dual stimulation when we do, we don't go beyond 225 for this category. So it's just 150 to 225 in the follicular phase, 150 to 25 in the luteal phase, pick up the oocytes, embryos and freeze it. Uh, one and two, of course, I showed you, you can go up to 300. So for three and four, 150 is standard for almost all patients. Very high BMI, you could increase to 225. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Sir, we'll take the last question from Dr. Shirisha Rani. Uh, Ma'am is saying, sir, any difference in pregnancy rate when you do transfer on day 5 or day 6 progesterone for a blastocyte transfer? No, so I always given one day extra. So I don't have my own data on 5 days of progesterone for a 5-day embryo. But I showed you the available studies. These are the most recent studies which have come where they compared three and five days for a day three embryo and they compared five and seven days for a blastocyst. One day extra and again I showed you the day six and day seven comparison. So I think you should stick to that one day more than the stage of the embryo. So if it's a five, day five blastocyst, sixth day of progesterone should be your embryo transfer. So that is a very simple way to remember and not confuse the whole issue. Thank you, sir. Dr. Shiraj Shalani says, uh, excellent presentation, great fan of your lectures. Uh, and she has also many questions, but I think, sir, we have almost reached uh, 5.45. Yeah. And uh, questions don't seem to end. Uh, dear delegates, we are very uh, sorry that we will not be able to take all, all questions. I'm just going through the chat. If I see something... Yeah. Yeah, in fact, if you can, uh, yeah, yeah, this is a particular very important question. You can actually reply it right now, sir. Amit, Amit there ah, is one question, I think. Dr. Pandit Palaskar has uh, asked, uh, uh, do you give OC pills as pre-treatment in agony cycle, sir? 
No, that's not required because why do you, why do you need pre-treatment in agonist cycle? I get this question very commonly. Now, the whole beauty of the agonist is for programming and scheduling in itself. So, unless he means, you know, that you have a batch only once in two months and that's why you need to put a lot of patients on OC pills to get their periods at the same time. I think you can do a better job just giving them norethisterone from day 25 or so and then you start the uh, agonist also day 21. And then maybe just play around a bit one week plus or minus with that. So OC pill with agonist, I think you are just asking for trouble. You will have to give too much of exogenous FSH, HMG and the cost will really escalate. So there's no reason to really give it when you have norethisterone, which is a much, much easier option than giving OC pills. Right, sir. Right. The OC pills, uh, the adverse effects I showed you are in the mm -hmm. antagonist protocols. So everything which goes wrong with prolonged OCP is in antagonist cycles because most of the world has now switched to antagonist cycles. So that's why I showed you because agonist trigger you can't give in an agonist cycle. So what the slide I showed you of suboptimal response is with agonist trigger in egg donors. So that is the whole point that in antagonist cycle OCP treatment is not ideal. In agonist you are anyway suppressing which is why you are getting your uniform cohort. And with agonist, you can always continue the agonist itself for 7 days, 10 days, 15 days more. And uh, don't have to give OC pills, not required. Because it's too much of programming there. So, I think it's easy to play with not at least. Right, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, uh, we can now call off the session. May I now request uh, Rajiv, sir, to please uh, give a formal vote of thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Amit. Uh, I am Rajiv Agarwal on behalf of MCure Pharmaceutical Limited. I really thank Dr. Jatin Shah for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And uh, coming on the board second time, it's really a privilege and honor, sir. Uh, we hope to come, uh, we hope to that see you again on the board uh, because we have seen your PowerPoint presentation still. Yeah, a lot of question answer is still coming, sir. Yeah, I'm trying so, to answer on the chat. Let's see. But this will close now. Thank right? you very much, sir. Once again, I... This, this won't close, sir. We can keep it Just open. We are giving all oh, thanks. Okay. <laughs> we had it a lot, two hours. Ago. So, <laughs> we, I think, uh, not from uh, India, across the country, a lot of doctors joined, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful presentation. I thank all the doctors who have patiently had the webinar. I thank my team for making this webinar successful. And uh, they have really worked hard. And uh, we hope that in Mumbai and Maharashtra will come out very soon from this COVID uh, situation. The situation is really bad. But let us hope for the best. And till the time, we wish all stay healthy and safe life.